May Jesus Christ be praised now and forever. Amen. Praise be to our Lord Jesus Christ, both now and forever. We are back once more after the break in transmission. We would like to apologize for the break in transmission. Already we are airborne into today's annual lecture of Francis Cardinal Arinze on the topic on fostering priestly and religious vocations. The introduction of the members of the eye table and the ocean of the guests having been done, the opening prayer said by His Eminence Francis Cardinal Arinze, the presentation and the breaking of color notes, as well as the Archbishop's opening remarks have been made. Now we are airborne into the lecture proper by His Eminence Francis Cardinal Arinze on fostering priestly and religious vocation. Whenever we think of this topic, lots and lots of questions come up. Among these questions include, what is vocation? Is vocation possible in this our present time? How did the youths of this present time understand and appreciate vocation? Does vocation vary from one place to another? Is there a time factor in vocation? What are the kinds of vocation? What is the priestly vocation? What is the religious vocation? Are both similar or do they differ in degrees? What is the importance of vocation? Of priestly vocation or religious vocation? And how can we foster vocation? These and many more questions His Eminence Francis Cardinal Arinze will be addressing these questions. Stay tuned and follow and ride along with His Eminence, Francis Cardinal Arinze. The way of life lived by Christ and taught by him laid the foundation for a pursuit of perfect charity as the Second Vatican Council puts it through the exercise of the evangelical councils. That means poverty, chastity, obedience. And how such a pursuit serves as a blazing emblem of the heavenly kingdom. 
the consecrated life took many forms from the days of St. Anthony of Egypt. Not St. Anthony of Padua, two of them great, but St. Anthony of Padua is more recent, only about 400 years ago. But St. Anthony of Egypt, only in the year 251 to 355, so it's already 1900 years, the beginnings of the religious life, St. Anthony of Egypt. It is today canonically approved in the forms of monasteries, religious orders and congregations, secular institutes, hermits, and other forms like consecrated virgins. They all take the three vows of chastity, poverty, and obedience. In our present paper, we focus on the first two forms. That means monasteries and religious orders and congregations, which in general we call religious. They are also the most numerous of those who live the consecrated life. The church is grateful to God for the gifts and courages of such great religious as St. Benedict, Bernard, Francis of Assisi, Clara of Assisi, Dominic, Ignatius of Loyola, Don Bosco, and Teresa of Calcutta. As the Second Vatican Council puts it, the religious state reveals in a unique way that the kingdom of God and its overmastering necessity are superior to all earthly considerations. That means that a young man or woman can take the three vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience and live them shows that the grace of God is more powerful than anything you can imagine in this world. Foster vocations to these states of life. As the Lord Jesus went about cities and villages, teaching is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Pray therefore, the Lord of the harvest, to send out laborers into his harvest. Divine providence will not deny to his church the young people needed to answer these vocations. But God expects us to pray for this purpose and to do our part to get them realized. Even when a young person has responded positively to these vocations, there is still a long way to go for proper living of them. To follow God's call, does not exempt the individual from prayer and discipline, difficulties and risks, courage and suffering, and the need to learn to go against the current regarding what many members of society may be doing. The candidates and their formators are bound to engage in discernment that means effort to find out God's will more clearly for each candidate. This can include prayer, reflection on the candidate's qualities, abilities, and tendencies, and seeking advice from parents, teachers, and other wise people, and examination of conscience by the candidate. All that we call discernment. The church also should, in suitable ways, make appeal to young people to embrace these ways of life. No matter how happy and abundant the response of young people may be at a particular moment to these two vocations in a local church, like in most parts of Nigeria today, there should be no presumption that this will always be so. Situations can change. The church in Nigeria, for example, can learn from the situation in most parts of Europe and North America at the present. At one time, Ireland and Holland were the countries that sent out the largest number of missionaries by proportion to their population in the world. Today, not so. 
the vocations to priesthood and religious life are very scarce in these two countries today. It is not superfluous to organize appeals for candidates to priesthood or religious life in schools, parishes, gatherings, and youth rallies. For instance, a diocese could think of practical arrangements such as providing a minibus for the representatives of the various religious congregations for women and another for men to make such appeals. After this show of unity and harmony, consult them. On the world level, we thank God that the church celebrates each year a day for the promotion of priestly and religious vocations, generally the fourth Sunday of Easter. Seminary formators. From the days of the Council of Trent, 16th century, the church has seen the necessity to set up formal seminaries for the promotion of future priests. Some countries have junior seminaries, like Nigeria, for boys in, at the secondary school level, for preparation of the sacred priesthood. Of obligation are what we in Nigeria call senior or major seminaries, where candidates are formed in philosophy and theology. Most parts of the world today prepare their candidates with a year or two of vocation discernment before philosophy. Sometimes they call it propadeutic. What applies to all these stages is that the priestly candidate is not just taught courses or principally tested in examinations, also that, but a much more important and deeper requirement is the all-round formation which the candidate receives in prayer life, general spiritual discipline, spiritual sacramental life, the living of the Christian life by rep deepening in the various virtues, pastoral practice, and general following of Christ with intense commitment. A, great, a key role is played by the ordained priests who cooperate with the seminary rector in all-round preparation of the Levites. That is why the church calls these priests formators and not just professors, although they are also professors. It would be a pity if a priest selected by his bishop for this key apostolate does not appreciate its importance and the honor being done to him, but prefers to teach in a secular university. It follows that the church in any country should regard the choice of priests who are to be seminary formators as the most important, a most important responsibility. It is not enough that such priests have the needed university degree. It is it not obvious that they should be model priests, since no one can give what he does not have. They themselves need spiritual, special formation in order to fulfill well their role as formators of future priests. I was very happy to hear that the father promoters, formators in Blessed Tans Seminary, have their own session of formation before the seminarians return from holidays. St. John Paul II therefore states that the bishop, first of all, should feel their grave responsibility for the formation of those who have been given the task of educating future priests. The Congregation for Catholic Education insists on the same thing. You can read the quote. Is that seminary formation formators should teach the seminarians well on the vocations of the religious and the lay faithful, together with the theology that underlies these vocations. This is necessary in order to equip priests to work with religious and lay faithful, not to assume an attitude of domination towards them 
and therefore to avoid all behavior that savors of clericalism or class arrogance. What are formators for religious? The proper renewal of religious institutes depends chiefly on the formation of their members. Every religious congregation or order makes a careful choice of those proven members who are to be its formation personnel. It will be well if the formators of religious pay special attention to training the candidates in emotional maturity, honesty of character, which avoids all pretense and duplicity, avoidance of wrong ideas on holiness, such as praying in the chapel when the regulation says the novices should be playing games, exclusion of all abnormal desire to please the superior, and the stubborn conviction of a candidate that he, or more generally she, must live and die a religious, even when all the advice is in that another way of life is the indication of God's will for that candidate, arrived at after discernment. In the Nigerian situation, it is also useful to help candidates to the religious Help, help candidates to help candidates to the religious life not to see themselves as superior to the lay faithful, to not to look down on marriage or to seek special seating in church celebrations or social functions. Experience has proved that both for candidates to religious life and for seminarians, it is useful to engage the services of proven psychologists. So seminarians and candidates to religious life, when you are asked to meet a psychologist, do not say that the superiors think you are now getting mad or funny. It is just to assess your character to help to help the superiors to know best how to help you to become a better person. In that way, the, super, the superiors will know the side of the character of the individual, the side of the character that should be encouraged, and the side of the character to be discouraged. They will also know candidates who are finally not suitable for that life. Sato, who later on became Pope, his mother, when he was made Bishop of Mantova, he showed his ring as Bishop to his mother, and the mother admired his Episcopal ring, but also informed her son that her wedding ring was better 
and earlier. We may add that her wedding ring helped to fashion the Episcopal ring and to lay foundations for it. So his mother was a good theologian. Is it really necessary to assert the importance of the parents forming the children in the virtues of charity, self-sacrifice, import good consideration of other people, chastity, honesty, singleness of purpose, single-mindedness, prayer, and love of the church. Without these fundamental virtues, a vocation to the priesthood or religious life is not likely. It is right for parents to desire and pray that one or more of their children should be called by God to the sacred priesthood or the religious life. This would be a great honor for the parents and for the family. The parents should be calm about what happens. It will not be correct for the parents or relatives to pressurize the children one way or the other. Rather, if one of their children expresses the desire for priesthood or religious life, the parents should thank God and encourage their son or daughter to reject all half measures and to live their vocation with 100% dedication. The Nigerian response to the call to follow Christ has on record a family where three daughters have become religious, that is in Ehala, and another family from which five of the children have become priests or religious, that is, I think, in Uyo Diocese. God be praised for his grace, and may the parents be blessed now and forever. Some parents may be too poor to find the funds to pay for the formation courses of their children who opt for priesthood or religious life. An attentive parish priest will seek ways to help getting help from richer parishioners to help the poorer parishioners whose children go to seminary or religious life. It is not right that parents or family members should expect to be enriched with church funds just because their son or relative is a priest or religious. It is understandable if a diocesan priest gives his parents or relatives a little money from the little pocket money that the diocese gives him. But relatives should not tempt their priest son or relative to divert church funds to them. Similar remarks apply to religious brothers or sisters. The relatives should not look on it as an op op opportunity for them to get rich. Rather, the relatives should give money to their priest son or sister or brother to promote such funds. They should not say to them, as somebody said to me 40 years ago, Another one said to Okafo, Bishop Okafo, when he was my secretary, Bishop Okafo, is in the Yeguka, But the priest is not ordained in order to channel money to his relatives. The brother or sister, even less. The role of the Catholic community. Apart from the priests, the Catholic community in the parish or beyond it 
is made up of religious brothers and sisters and lay people, many of whom are organized in societies such as the Lady Council, the CMO, the CWO, the CION, the CBO, the CGO, and other groupings. In many ways, these people contribute to the selection and training of candidates to the priesthood and religious life. They give advice to the candidates and to their formators. They work with the candidates according to what is possible in parish or even diocesan situations. They show love and respect for the candidates. They associate these candidates with pastoral or other work, much as apprentices learn from masters. They do not forget to give respectful correction to those who make mistakes. Some seminarians have become much better because during holidays, they were advised by members of CWO. They make clear to candidates that the lay people are not willing to support poor quality priests or religious. Without threatening any of them, the lay people and the religious are nevertheless aware that before ordination or dia to diaconate or before final profession of religious, there is an announcement made in the parish that anyone who knows what could be an obstacle should come forward and speak before it is too late. In this way, it has happened that lay people and religious have saved the church from the mistake of ordaining an unsuitable person to the priesthood because it is possible, or allowing such a person to make religious profession with the embarrassing consequences that one can imagine. It is very encouraging to see that some laymen or women serve in seminary commissions in some dioceses, and that the CWO, for example, has been sending food and food items to the seminary. May God bless and reward all those lay people who are contributing in many ways for the selection and formation of future priests and religious. The school. The school being the institution to formalize and quicken the work of education can contribute much to the fostering of priestly and religious vocations. If a school performs in accordance with what is expected, it will form its students in the ba basic virtues of study, discipline, punctuality, due attention for law and order, respect for established authority, acceptance of failure and in examinations or in sports. Because both in examination and in football, you may fail. Do you accept it? Such attitudes are precious when it is a question of suitability for priesthood or the religious life. If the school is well functioning as a Catholic school, then its increased capacity to orient students for such vocations is obvious. A good Catholic school offers students a living synthesis of faith, school discipline, character formation, orientation to meaningful citizenship, and dedication to serious studies. In short, integral human education. To a great extent, the teachers make the school, not the signboard. Many priests and religious know that they owe much in their initial formation to the school teachers at the primary and secondary school level. My personal experience is that my teachers had joy in seeing their students grow up. I remain grateful to such primary school teachers as Matthew Eke of Ozobo, Christopher Wonyubo of Onicha, Patrick Okeke 
of Alo, Vincent Okolo of Orivit, in my primary school days, about 100 years ago. And in the junior seminary, I passed through careful hands of Father William Brawley, Charles Amasian, he often in Canada, and was head of Knights of the Murumba of Nigeria. He's only 90 years old. And also in the major seminary, I cannot forget Father James O'Neill.